Ever get that feeling if you're, if you're born into the wandering family, you better start packing your bags? <laughs> wonderful, it's, isn't it wonderful? How children of missionaries can become children of missionaries. So, how God uses uh, any number of people for missions in this particular family. He's uh, used a number of them, and we're thankful. But you know what? You don't have to go overseas to be missionaries. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, because... Um, uh, we have mission work right here to do in, in Roselawn. In fact, yesterday I was, I always read the bulletin a, a week in advance, so I thought I had read the food pantry was open. What, what, what Saturday is it always open? Who knows? Yes, you're, you know better than I do. I, I was sure it was yesterday, it was the second Saturday, and so I went there, and it's all, of course, dark and, and, and gloomy and like. So then I went over to this other thing called uh, this woodcutting ministry. Woodcutting ministry? You've got to be kidding me. No, we have, uh, boy, a, a number of people and a number of lives being uh, uh, encouraged by this ministry that was started. In fact, maybe you saw this article. Make sure I get the name of the correct magazine. The Newton County Newspaper. Did you see this and read this? This is called Missions right here. Community... Volunteers split and load firewood for the needy in the area, serving the kingdom. For some residents in our community, the article says, access to firewood is sparse and on a limited income. If you run out of firewood and you do not have the financial beans to buy more, where can you turn for heat? Well, it says, community church firewood ministry is a great place to start. Just a month ago, on Saturday, February 3, a group of more than 50 individuals gathered to split logs and then delivering them to uh, as, as many as 60 cords to dozens of families in the county. More than 50 people showed up to serve the community on that, on that day on Saturday. Teams of two and three men, 10 log splitters. It was kind of cool I, since I was, I was like all dressed up, so that was my excuse for not grabbing a log, but another day maybe. The, to see all of these machines running, people donating their loaders, their skid steers, uh, their hands, men, women, teenagers, these, these log splitters, amazing. What they can do, just amazing. Watching all this wood is just so quickly split up and put on trucks and the like and brought uh, to different places over in the community. And uh, people just being uh, so pleased and touched that, of all things, really, are you kidding me? A church involved and passing out wood to people. And, and some of them say, praise the Lord for that. Wonderful, great. What an opportunity. Missionaries in our own community by bringing wood. Somebody else might say, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Pastor Jim. Do you even dare to call wood splitting a ministry? What's that all about? Or I understand your church will hand out gas cards to people in, in need of gas from getting to here and there. Or, or you have this thing called the food pantry, which I believe can be expanded and even made better than what it is. That's another story. But you've got this thing called the food pantry. You hand out food, and, and you have members here who spend their time with an, a ministry called Kids Hope in, in the local school next door in Lincoln School, uh, helping uh, tutor them with, with some of their work. And, and you have somebody at your church who organized this thing called mobility carts. Really? You've got to be kidding me. Toys? Or real carts that people in other countries can actually get along in because they don't have a vehicle. You send people on surf projects. We have ministries in our denomination called World Renew. We recently have flood victims in Hebron. People who are displaced from their homes and some of us step forward and let the, the powers that be know, hey, if someone needs a place to stay for a month or two, my home is open. Are you kidding me? Reaching out to migrants, immigrants, even illegal immigrants, because there are needs that need to be met. Showing compassion to people, Pastor Jim, time out. Ministry is supposed to be about the word. And we preach the gospel to people. They would spend their time better, all of these ministries, handing out the four spiritual laws to people. Or handing out Bibles to all of these people. Because it's the word of God that changes hearts and how people are transformed. And it's true. So why are we wasting your, wasting your time having deed, good deeds, deeds ministry when we should be proclaiming the gospel? And my response to that would be, really? 
Is that what maybe somebody thinks when they hear that? That being the case, which might be in some of our minds or hearts, would you turn to Isaiah 58 with me? There are, there are hundreds. In our small groups this week, I challenged the first, the first um, congregation at, at 815, hundreds of Bible verses and passages that deal with paying attention to the poor. Just Google it in. If you're a small group leader this week, Google in what the Bible says about the poor, and you'll have a great list to go off of in your group this week. But we're going to turn to Isaiah 58, 1116 in the Bible in the chair in front of you. Because I want you to listen what God has to say to Isaiah to the very, very same thing that people may have been questioning or not even paying attention to in that day. Because God makes it very clear here what he expects of those people who call themselves his children. Isaiah 58. Shout it out. Do not hold back. Why do you think he's got to shout it out? Well, obviously, he tried before and nobody was listening. Parents, what do you do when your kids aren't listening? Oh, you just go and sit down and you're nice and quiet and you say, that's okay, Junior. I understand you'll do it maybe tomorrow. Sometimes you just lose it, right? I was going to be that perfect parent. I'm never going to lose it. <laughs> I'm glad my children aren't here this morning to talk because sometimes you lose it because people don't listen, right? Kids don't listen. God says, listen, my people are the same. Shout it out, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. As if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why, they say, why have we fasted? And you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you, God, have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day, a certain day, for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this, is not this the kind of fast I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. He will answer you will cry when you cry out for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will be your guide always, and he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here it is. Thank you. 2,500 years ago, there was a problem. There was a big problem. And, and, and 
God could have left it to itself and Israel could have gone their own ways and, and forever been abandoned by God, but we don't have a God like that. But there was a problem that God had to address, first of all, with, with his people of 2,005 years ago who were called the people of Israel. And the problem was simply this. They did a really good job at paying attention to God. I mean, by all appearances, their day of worship, they worshiped him. Their day of fasting, they fasted. They would bring their monies, their tithes before the Lord. I mean, they did everything any what we would call a good Christian today would do. They did it all and even above and beyond. Anybody who saw them would say, wow, what, what a holy, righteous people they are. Aren't they something? They're very religious. Look at how eager they are to seek God out. Hey, that was the situation and everything looked good. But the problem that God sent Isaiah to address was simply that they were not paying attention to those in need. Their religion was defined totally this. My vertical relationship with God. That, that's what their religion consisted of. And it looked, and it was something to, to really applaud. But the problem, God says, as he goes to Isaiah, there was something going on this way that wasn't happening so focused and gave all their attention to God and all the praise and all the honor, but they were ignoring the needs of all those around them who were definitely in need. They were blind to the fact that there were people facing oppression, injustice, and really just didn't care. Unsympathetic, uncaring, lack of compassion. Loving God, let's just say, on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, not loving their neighbor. One quote I came across this week simply said, the greatest cruelty is our casual blindness to the despair of others. That's what God was saying, first of all, to Israel this morning. Blindness, ignorance, and thinking everything is just fine in my relationship with God. As I began writing this message uh, two or three weeks ago, I, I began thinking about how easy it is for us as Christians to fall into that same trap, isn't it? So easy to, because on Sundays you gather here with me, with Kyle and the praise band, and, and we, we lead you into the presence of God, and, and we sing songs like, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O God, rejoice. I love you, God, and we pray, Lord, oh, how we love you. Receive the praises of your people. And we have offerings that we bring in and we give our, our gifts to the Lord. It, it, gifts even for those who are needy and for missionaries and the like and for all kinds of ministries. So we sing and we talk the talk and we give of our gifts. And by all appearances, as you look around at each other, we can leave and we can pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, wasn't that great, that connection that we have with God? We pay a lot of attention to him on Sunday, don't we? And surely God is pleased with that, at least. We think he is pleased with that. But then Monday comes, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. And there just might be a similar problem that Israel was facing. Simply, what's going on those other six days when you leave this place? You paid attention to God here, and you might even pay attention to God on some of those days going this way. But then become blind to those around us who have special needs, needy people who need to be touched with the love of Jesus Christ. And it, we can appear to be very religious, but not very righteous. That's a big difference. Israel was very religious. The Pharisees in the New Testament were very religious people, but they weren't righteous people. And first of all, we got to be careful of being, showing signs of being very religious people, whether it's fasting, whatever spiritual discipline you might have, but in the process of not showing any attention to those who need our loving hands, become the hands and, and feet of Jesus around us. We talk the talk, but we don't always necessarily walk the walk during the week. And the attitude that we can easily take upon ourselves is simply, hey, um, I just don't care. I love you, God. I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I don't care about anybody else around me. 
Besides, I have my own needs that need to be taken care of. In fact, Lord, when I pray, tell me how often your prayers are like this. We pray for what we need, right? Give me what I need, Lord, whether it's health or whether it's a, a difficulty you're going through or something about one of your children or grandchildren, whatever it might be. You're saying, Lord, bless me in this way for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, is it right to pray that way? Absolutely. You, God wants to know that you depend upon him. But that's not where your prayers should stop because what happens with those kind of prayers? You get so selfish and so self-focused that we forget about God blessed us to be a blessing to others, you see. He says, when was the last time you prayed for that neighbor or that coworker or that person in your, in your neighborhood or in your, in your realms of relationships, if you have any of those types, that you know there's a need? When you hear that there's a need here, what happens? Does, does your heart bleed a little bit for that? Is there something that moves you towards him and saying, there's something I can do? Or is your, is your religion just this? And if it is, you better have a clear out your ears this morning because God has a message for you if this is all your religion is. Because in God's eyes, it's not worth a thing. I'll just be flat out and say it. It's not worth a thing to me if this is all it is. Does God care about the poor, the needy, those who are shown injustice and oppressed? Absolutely. In fact, if God comes to their prophet Isaiah and he says, listen, it's time for a wake-up call. And he says, i got to shout it out because I brought this to your attention before through other prophets, and you're not listening. Say, Mom and Dad, why are, you, why are you raising your voice at me? Because you're not listening. Sorry, I lose it sometimes. God gets angry too if he's told us time and time again, this is what obedience looks like. Now, how many times do I have to tell you until you, until you get it right? Yeah, but do you have to shout? God says, I'm shouting out, Isaiah. They're not listening. You've got to bring this to their attention because I want to make sure they have what's called true religion and true righteousness and authentic religion. You've got to shout it out. Yes, you talk the talk, Israel, and it all sounds good, but you are not walking the walk. Show me how much you really love me and that you're religion is genuine by how you treat other people. This is what he says in Isaiah 58. He says, Israel, listen, is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? You think the fasting that I like most is to see you on your knees and you're going through the motions, manipulating me at times to get what you want. He says, no, this is what true fasting looks like. Loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, break, set the oppressed free, break every yoke. Isn't that to share food to the hungry and, pie, and provide the poor wanderer with housing? This is true religion. That's righteousness. And if all you bring me is this on Sunday, and this is not happening in any form, you better go home and have a gut check because a litmus test for true religion is how you treat your neighbor and those who are in need. God says to Israel, listen, if you do this, verses 8 through 12, you can read them again. Then I'm going to bless you in so number of ways. Then, then your dawn will light up like it's never have before. If you think you've been blessed so far in your life by me, but it's not even begun to happen yet. And the way to get more of that blessing for me is not just to pray for it and say, Lord, bless me because I'm your child. You go and reach out to the oppressed and those who are victims of injustice. And to anyone that you know of is in need, you reach out to them and don't expect that I'm going to bless you because you did that. Don't do it to manipulate me to bless you, but you are going to do it out of the love that you have for me in your heart and you're going to reach out, Israel, and touch the lives of those around you. Do that, and I will bless you like you've never been blessed before, as, as a new light in the dawn. And you'll just see, and I, and I see this, I've seen this since I've been here for these few years, how God has done that in some of your lives, where you've given of yourself to people in need, and now God is blessing you because of it. And it's not always just a financial blessing. For those of you who've done any kind of serve projects or helped someone in need, isn't there something that happens? where you just feel good. And you don't want the money. You say, don't pay me for what I'm doing. Some of you can't afford it anyway. But just to do a good deed for someone, when you come back from a serve project or you, or you helped a neighbor in need or somebody else in need, God just is like, wow, this is what it feels like to be truly religious. 
That's what God is talking about to Isaiah, and that's what God is talking about to us this morning. He says, listen up. He says, Church of Jesus Christ, this goes for you as well. And sometimes we can just kind of go through the motions of church and show up here on Sunday at 10 o'clock and say, here's, here's my religion, God. I'm lifting everything up before you. I'm praising you, and I'm feeling you with your presence, and it's great. Thank you. And then we leave Monday through Saturday, and nothing's happening on this level. God says, listen up, church. Yes, it's, it's important to seek me out and to be eager to seek me out, which you are. But he says it doesn't stop there. He says, what I need to know is what happens on Monday through Saturday. You can talk the talk all you want, but are you walking the walk? That's what this is about. You can talk to me on Sunday. You can talk to me in the privacy of your devotional life and, and through prayer and reading of the word. You can do talk to me all you like, wonderful, needed, but is, are you walking Monday through Saturday? Are you touching lives? Are you changing lives? Are you looking for people who are in need and saying, I'm there to help you in any way that I can? Don't just talk the talk, he says to us. You need to walk the walk. Do you really care is the bottom line. Because if you really love me, you're going to have sympathy, a caring, compassionate kind of attitude to those in need. Or is your life spent around just focusing on your needs and you just never get around to the needs of those around you? As I was preparing this this week, I, I thought about these words in 1 John. Let me read these few verses because this is what Isaiah is talking about. He says, this is how we know, 1 John 3, 16 through 18, this is how we know what love is. You say you love me, says God? Listen, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives to our brothers and sisters. Now, that's just not talking about I'll die for you. But in a sense, this is a dying to yourself. He says, this is how I know you really love me. This is how I know your Christianity is true. This is how I know that your relationship with me is the real deal. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in you? Whoa, wow. Pretty clear, isn't it? You say you love me? Then why isn't it shown in having pity and compassion for those in need around you? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Wow. I need to hear that every once in a while. And I'm sure you have to hear it this morning as well. We can become so focused on ourselves and our needs and of what we want and keep going before God to ask for them to get them. And then forget all along the process that God chose you to be his child so that you could be a blessing to others. Not just to get what you want from God and move on. Blessed to be a blessing. Interesting, you know, Jesus, when he walked for those 33 and some years in this world, he would never ask us to do something that he didn't do it himself. Any good leader would never ask you to do something that he would first do him or herself. And Jesus, of course, talked the talk, right? Just a few chapters later in Isaiah, Jesus is standing up in Luke chapter 4, and he's reading the scroll from Isaiah. And then he reads these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed and proclaim this is the Lord's favor. Jesus steps back and says, Hey, what is, who Isaiah is talking about is me. That's why I'm here. But so far, just words, right? Jesus spoke these words. He's talking the talk. But he didn't just talk the talk. We find as, as we read through the Gospels, and, he, and here's one passage that we find, and you'll find many, where Jesus was going through all the cities, teaching the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, there's the word ministry. But also healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus not only talked the talk, he walked the walk. You go through any gospel and highlight with your yellow height marker all the times Jesus touched the life of someone by a good deed. Miracles even sometimes. Some people say, Jesus, the way he got people to, to, to come to him was through the word and, and only through the word. And that, that's not true. Read the Gospels. Sometimes he just spoke the word to someone without a good deed and opened their heart to receive the Gospel. 
A lot of the times as we read through the Gospels, Jesus, first of all, did a good deed, right? And then they were like, wow, who is this person? And by doing that good deed, it gave them an opportunity then to preach or give the word of hope to them. Jesus always functioned with word and deed ministry, word and deed ministry, sometimes one before the other, never one separate to itself. Word and deed, deed and word. And, and in doing so, he transformed lives. He changed lives by doing this kind of ministry. Now, we recently changed our, our vision statement here at Community. For a number of years, we were known as the people who celebrate Christ and restore community. I still like it. Don't ever put that out of your minds. Because that really tells us what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about. But recently, and we haven't yet presented this to the congregation in a way in which you could have to explain it even more fully, but we will as months go on with the new ministry alignment team being formed. Now our vision statement has everything to do with what, what we're kind of limited as life's transformed by Christ. Same thing as celebrating Christ restoring community. But transformed lives through Jesus Christ and through the power of the gospel. Transforming lives. That's why Jesus walked in this place. And that's why the church of Jesus Christ, this is why community exists. For the mere sake, we give glory to God by transforming lives. And in order to do that, we need to understand and just get this thing of word and deed ministry that operates together. And as I began thinking about this uh, over the last number of weeks, I, just, I get kind of excited about this stuff. Because already we, we kind of have a reputation of being, that's why we're called community church. We want to be in touch with our community. But as far as I can see after a few years, a lot of our connection to the community is here in this building. Right? We have these big events, as many as four big, wonderful, God-blessed events that we have here. And we're just shocked at how many people come who've never stepped foot in a church before. All good and fine and dandy. When we had Sam Hamster going through our vision process with us, he reminded us, he said, well, good, I'll clap your hands for that. Way you go. But he says, you know, there's a problem. And I agree with him. And, and this, it's not shouting it out yet because we, we already do some of these things, as I mentioned earlier. But he says, well, what are you going to do to get out there into the community and actually into their homes and into their lives? Because you're doing this okay with getting them here. But word and deed ministry needs to happen on their turf, where they live, and to understand even, even what their needs are. In fact, if I were to ask, how many of us could list the top three needs facing needy people and families in Newton County? How many of you could list the top three in the order of one, two, three? My guess is not many of us. You might be able to obviously grab one. There's, some obvious, there's an obvious one. But you know the second and the third? What are the needs of the community where God has placed us in, in Newton County, in Roselawn community? What specific needs? And we don't always necessarily can just rattle them off. Well, we've got to be able to do that. But maybe one reason we can't do that is because we don't know what they are necessarily. Because we can be so focused on ourselves and meeting needs the other way that we can't necessarily take this other step of actually meeting people. So here's what I think sometimes. Let me just... Quickly, some of you like to brainstorm ministry, dream ministry. I've always enjoyed doing that. Let me just throw some things out to you in closing that things we could do still. Uh, our deacons to grab a hold of this. Outreach team maybe needs to meet with the deacons and have a, have a powwow, if I can call it that way, just a time together. Here's some things that could happen. Because we want to show Roselawn and we want to be known as a church that really cares for its community. We got this thing down really good. We're doing a lot of things this way already, but we can even do more, okay? This is what I'm talking about. How do we touch lives of those who are needy? Um, one thing that could be done, very, I think it's rather simple to do, we get a hold of community leaders, business community leaders, church community leaders, other leadership and churches in the area here in Roselawn, and we say, let's have a sit down and send out letters, emails, whatever it takes to the residents here in Roselawn, and say, we're going to have a listening session at Roseland Library. We're just going to sit down with you because the sole purpose of we want to know what your needs are and we want to be a blessing to you. I would have no doubt in my mind that business leaders, other leaders in the community, church leaders would come along with residents of the community and saying, here we are. I think I even have a pick for that. We're all ears. We are all ears. Tell us 
your needs. We want to know them so that we can be a blessing to you. And how do you get those needs? This is one way. You have a meeting in a general area called Roselawn Library and say, let's meet together. We're all ears. Tell us what your needs are so that we can go back to our churches and assess what we have as far as resources to help meet them. We can't meet all of them. The woodcutting thing is one good example of a recent need that has come up. But there are others. What can be done? Now, let's get that, identify those needs and, the, and what resources are needed to meet them. That's one opportunity, I think, that, that could easily be done. Another one is something I've done in other churches. And you just have to, first, when you knock on doors, which is what this is all about, you have to let the people know, we're not Jehovah Witnesses, okay? Please don't push us away. We're not here with just a word like that to try to get you to believe something that's not true. We're here because we're, we're, we're friends of yours from the community. We're from Community Church, and the sole purpose of our coming today to talk with you is, one, first we want to get a list of needs that you have that we want to pray for you on a regular basis. You don't, if you don't want to give us your name, that's fine. But we want to know what your need is, and we want to, we'll pray with, with you that now, or we'll, or we'll pray with them when we get back at church. We just care about you that much. Two, we also want to know what your needs are. And when I've done this in the, in the previous church I served, we simply knocked on the door and said, we have a, not a, three questions. The second one was, what are two or three of your basic needs that you have as a family or as an individual? Would you mind sharing them with us? Just because we want to be able to meet... We love our community, and we, we love you, and we want to be able to meet some of these needs. What are they? And then you bring all that information, because this takes a little bit of work. you got to, you know, if you try to get every door, and you can't quite get everyone, but a whole lot of them you can. We bring that information back to church. Deacons, outreach team sits down, organizes all, and said, okay, look, here are the two or three basic needs in the Roselawn area. What are we doing in meeting them, and what maybe more can we do to meet them? That's just gathering information. I like this next one. You ready? With this, we have this building next door called the Generation Center, right? I don't know a whole lot about it, but someone mentioned to me in passing that they had heard maybe they were thinking about moving, like someplace else, for whatever reason. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm thinking, oh, what do you think I'm thinking? Oh, we could buy that building? We don't, have to build it. we don't have to build another facility. That's, that would become our property. I think that butts right to our property. And we could do all kinds of things with that building. It could continue as it is, as a, as a generation center. We could welcome teens. We could welcome senior citizens. We can welcome people with needs. We can have a counseling center. It could be a youth center. I mean, the, the list goes on depending on what the needs are and saying, look, that's our, this is our community, quote, building where we're going to meet needs of people in some way. Don't know what that might be yet, but that, that makes me kind of excited because we can afford to buy it. You don't think so, but we can. And what a, what a ministry that could become. And we also all struggle with space here anyway for, for, for educational ministries. We also could use it for that. There's just multiple opportunities for that kind of building. And it's right here. I'd love to get people together and brainstorm them and say, how could this work? Even to approach them and saying, hey, uh, maybe... Um, we want to be a blessing to you. We even will help you move if you're not thinking about it because we'd like to have this. Well, that, you know, you have to be nice that way because we, like, we need this building for our ministry center. How can, let's try to work something out. Multiple opportunities to meet needs in this community could be done right there. Um, or, second choice for me, if that didn't work, I've mentioned this before to some of you, this uh, place called Lake, was it Lake Holiday Plaza? Is that the name of that place down the road? How many, know, how many knows where that is? It's called Lake Holiday Plaza. That's that place where Save-A-Lot is and maybe, you know, Jordy's and Jack's, probably, maybe. We had the perch dinner there Friday. Oh, good. Um, we're not going there to buy the restaurant, but there's a lot of open units yet, like three, four, five open units just sitting there vacant. And I have to believe, I know we've worked with some of those the person who owns it before and sometimes good, sometimes not. I'm like, if I'm a landlord, I'm like, okay, this place sits empty for two, three, four, five years. Listen, let's, let's, do, let's cut a deal here. We want to use it again. We'd use that one of those units for our facility, whether it's clothes or whether it's moving the, the uh, food bank over there or whether it's um, 
um, uh, clothing, furniture, or that could become a teen center or a youth center or a counseling center or other needs, a tutoring, whatever it might be, to say, this is what we're offering to the community. Here we are as a church saying, we want to meet your needs, and we're willing to have this facility to help serve you. That kind of excites me too. There's four of these places open for Pete's sake. I'll just say, for God's sake, yes. Right? Why can't we sit down, talk about it, see what kind of thing we can come up with and try it for a year? Uh, the opportunity's there. The needs are there, even though we may not be able to specifically identify everyone. And that could become a community kind of center if this wouldn't work out. Uh, the, the opportunities are endless. I, I just want us to become more of a church that when people say community church, they're going to say, yeah, you know what? Those, those are people that just don't care for themselves. And we know that already because of the, what, the events that they do have. But now they're actually making a concerted effort to get more into the community itself and offering us opportunities to have needs met that, at least as of right now, are not being very well met. I want to challenge the deacons. I want to challenge the outreach team to get together and talk about these things. Because I can assure you, if you can lead us in one of these areas, we will follow. We will follow. Look what happened with the woodcutting ministry. One person has an idea. Two people have an idea. Now there's 50-some people and houses are being blessed. Of all things, with wood? Can you believe it? That was a need, obviously. Let's find out what the other needs are and do something. Sometimes you need a little spark, a little another fire to get things going. Again, we kind of become laid back and, and complacent. Lukewarm was one of the terms we had. Maybe it's time to consider some of that and to say, God, how can you use us to touch the lives of people, not just with the word, but with deeds. And, in, and then possibly through these good deeds, we'll have an opportunity to present the gospel and have them know who you are. To become, as verse 12 says, repairers of broken walls and restorer of streets and dwellings. I love that verse. Repairers and restorers, restorers of a community in need. Let's think about it. Let's pray about it and see what God can bring our way. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for challenging us this morning, if need be, to come out of any complacency that exists or even to get out of ourselves and away from ourselves and always focusing on our own needs. Surely you will bless us and meet our needs. But may we never forget, as Isaiah reminds us and as Jesus reminds us in Matthew 25 as well, that, um, boy, this is on the final exam. We stand before you someday, and he says, those of you who, who, who uh, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. You, welcome, you are welcome into my kingdom, my eternity forever. But for those who have not, guess what? You had religion, but you didn't have righteousness. You had your love for me, but, but you didn't have your love for your neighbor. We want to get it right so that someday when we stand before you, you can say, well done good and faithful church at community. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say, amen. Today is the third Sunday in the season of Lent, the 40 days leading up to, the, to our celebration of Easter. We prepare for Easter by focusing on repentance and renewal, just as our celebration of Advent prepared us for Christmas. God has challenged and convicted us through his word today. Let's join together in this prayer of repentance. Forgive us, Lord, for choosing to love America more than you. Forgive us for thinking our needs and wants as Americans are more important than the needs and wants of our brothers and sisters around the world. Forgive us for shutting ourselves away instead of providing the wanderer with shelter, instead of opening our lives to those in desperate need so that we may show them your light and love. Forgive us for choosing to love our family more than you, for making excuses, for shutting our doors and our hearts, for not trusting you to fill us with the love and strength to love like family those who are not our flesh and blood. Forgive us for choosing to love comfort more than you. Forgive us for settling for a surface level digital connection with people as we scroll mindlessly 
through social media, rather than truly showing your love face to face with those who need to know you but make us uncomfortable. Forgive us for loving our stuff more than you. Forgive us for putting our electronic time and playing with toys ahead of loving you and loving others. Forgive us for loving ourselves more than you, for thinking we are God, for pointing the finger at others instead of looking more deeply at ourselves and letting your spirit convict us and help us become more like you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love that softens our hard hearts. Fill our lives with your love that it may overflow into the people and communities around us. We have been blessed to be a blessing. We've been loved to show love. We've been invited to share your invitation. May we live that out, God. Amen.